Welcome to the Cancer Research Institute Cancer Immunotherapy and You webinar series. Today is Wednesday, October 18th, 2017, and on today's webinar, we'll discuss how new technologies are enabling scientists to develop personalized cancer treatments that are tailored to the unique genetic profile of a patient's tumors. My name is Brian Brewer, and I'm Director of Marketing and Communications at the Cancer Research Institute, a nonprofit organization dedicated to saving more lives by funding research that aims to harness the immune system's power to conquer all cancers. This work has contributed to the development of life-saving immunotherapies for a variety of cancer types, and we present this webinar series to patients and caregivers to help them understand what immunotherapy is and how it's different from other forms of cancer treatment, to provide information on the latest developments in research and treatment, and to connect patients to immunotherapy clinical trials. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsors who have made this webinar series possible, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Genentech, Regeneron, and Advaxis Immunotherapies. I'd also like to point out that if you're interested in hearing firsthand from experts on the latest developments in immunotherapy, we do provide an Immunotherapy Patient Summit series across the United States this year. We have two more coming up, uh, one in Tampa and one in Houston. Registration is free, and if you'd like more information on how to attend those, please go to cancerresearch.org forward slash summit. Now it's my pleasure to introduce today's expert speaker. Robert D. Schreiber is the director of the Center for Human Immunology and Immunotherapy Programs, the co-leader of the Tumor Immunology Program of the Siteman Cancer Center, and the Andrew M. and Jane M. Bursky Distinguished Professor of Pathology and Immunology at the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri. Missouri. Dr. Schreiber has made many significant contributions to our understanding of cancer immunology. In addition to his seminal work in characterizing fundamental molecular pathways involved in the immune response, he's also credited with resurrecting the field of cancer immunology when he provided the first definitive proof that the immune system can naturally protect against tumor development through a process known as immunosurveillance. He extended this concept to include a novel description of how the immune system shapes cancer over time, ultimately leading to tumors' ability to escape detection and elimination by the immune system. Most recently, he's made important contributions to understanding how analyzing a tumor's genes can lead to the development of personalized vaccines that target specific mutations found in an individual patient's tumors. Throughout his career, Dr. Schreiber has received many accolades for his work, including the 2001 William B. Coley Award and the 2013 Lloyd J. Old Memorial Award. He's also the recipient of the 2007 Charles Rodolph Brutbacher Prize. And next month, congratulations, Dr. Schreiber, he will be awarded the 2017 Bowson Prize, along with CRI Scientific Advisory Council Director James P. Allison. He's also been elected to the National Academy of Sciences and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And I might add, we are quite honored to note that he is a longtime associate director of the Cancer Research Institute Scientific Science Advisory Council. Council. Dr. Schreiber, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Brian. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I want to thank all of our listeners uh, for dialing in and uh, listening to this as well. So I always like to begin my talks recently by just reminding everyone that it's a truly remarkable time to be in the area of tumor immunology and cancer immunotherapy research. Uh, I don't think a day goes by when uh, now one or another major journals, scientific journals, or even the popular press doesn't carry uh, a story about uh, new findings within the interaction of the immune system uh, with developing or established tumors, or the application of what's learned from that information into uh, new uh, and more effective uh, immunotherapies for cancer. Um, and maybe part of this is because of what's happened over the last 10 to 15 years. I think there have been really three major developments that have uh, established that this is a field uh, that is moving forward and is doing good things for our cancer patients. One, as Brian mentioned to you, was the observation made in my lab together with Lloyd Old and uh, Mark Smith, as well as other laboratories, 
that the immune system, the natural immune system, actually was able to see developing cancers long before they became clinically apparent and uh, have direct effects on their ultimate fate uh, in vivo. So uh, this is a process that we've called cancer immunoediting. It, it was a derivative and a, a sort of advancement of the older concept of cancer immunosurveillance. But basically what it said is that the immune system could do two things. It could protect the host, so an individual who's developing cancer, by either recognizing the cancers as foreign and destroying them, or by taking any residual cancer cells that might have uh, survived that first phase, which we called e elimination, uh, and then holding them in a state of immune-mediated tumor dormancy, a state that we called equilibrium. During this process, any surviving cancer cells are shaped uh, immunologically so that they are better capable of surviving in an immunocompetent host. They enter into the escape phase of the process, which they then begin to grow uh, in a progressive manner, express these molecules that we'll be talking about in a moment that, um, that uh, immunosuppress uh, the, the patient uh, against their cancer and now emerge as the disease that we now know as cancer. And so the realization that a natural process is capable of, uh, of uh, restraining cancer or, it, or, or shaping cancer really, I think, set the stage for the big clinical findings that were to come in the future. The second uh, 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 thing is the, the second major uh, uh, achievement was work that was showing that, uh, that these immunosuppressive proteins that uh, are expressed on either T cells or their counter ligands on, uh, on tumor cells were there that interfered then with the natural functions of the immune system to control cancer. Now these proteins probably didn't evolve in the concept that they were gonna be uh, effective in inhibiting cancer, but rather is a natural response in the body to prevent the, our immune systems from uh, turning on ourselves. But nevertheless, to the immune system, a chronically growing cancer looks, and, and the immune response against that cancer looks very much like an autoimmune response. And so the body is trying to stop that, thinking that this is going to um, help prevent uh, immune-mediated damage to the, to the individual. So these are the proteins that have been called CTLA-4, PD-1, the, the, and, the, and their ligands, which basically are off signals to uh, tumor-specific T cells. And, um, and Jim Allison was the first to show that, in fact, the immune system um, now becomes uh, the, the target of the illness of cancer. That is, that the, it's the immune system that's sick. And by uh, reversing the immune system with drugs like antibodies that can prevent the inhibitory functions of the molecules like CTLA-4 and PD-1, uh, it's capable of now reactivating the immune system. Jim Allison would call it, take the brakes off the immune system um, and allow the immune system now to recognize Karen, God, cancer is foreign uh, and, and destroy it. The other major breakthrough has been the ability to engineer T cells, the sort of foot, so the foot soldiers of the immune system that are responsible for ultimately for killing the cancers. And to be able to engineer T cells either from a cancer patient or by engineering naive T cells and then um, uh, to make them specific for the cancer and then putting them back into the patient and showing that, in fact, these can have now uh, significant effects in controlling certain kinds of cancers that bear proteins on them or peptides on them uh, that the immune system T cells are directed against. So um, this is uh, a slide that basically really uh, emphasizes what I've just said. These two patients on the left, a slide that I got from uh, Jed Wolchak at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, 
These two patients on the left uh, are patients who uh, are, uh, are, are afflicted with uh, melanoma. They've actually developed into a stage four melanoma. If this were 10 or 15 years ago, there would be very little to uh, be able to treat these patients and have them survive. But using these engineered T cells or the autologous T cells that I just mentioned are treating these patients with the antibodies that are collectively known as checkpoint uh, blockade uh, inhibitors. Uh, um, uh, then you can see the remarkable curative effects uh, that these can have on at least certain types of cancer patients. So uh, this slide represents some of the current dogmas that are, uh, that are ongoing with respect to uh, the current uh, concepts in cancer immunotherapies. Uh, a very important one is that the recognition that the immune system is dysfunctional in cancer patients. And uh, this dysfunctionality, this immunosuppression that is largely guided towards the tumor itself allows the tumors to uh, cancers to grow out. Um, the, the current immunotherapy approaches really take one of two things that I've shown you already. They take the breaks off the immune system. This is the so-called immune checkpoint blockade therapy involving the antibodies that I just spoke about, or the use of immune cells expanded in an in vitro tumor-free environment, allowing them to mature into functionally active T cells and then um, uh, reinfused into the patient. We still have a number of challenges, however, and, and those challenges are that only a percentage of cancer patients respond after uh, the various forms of therapy, especially checkpoint blockade immunotherapy. And while checkpoint blockade immunotherapy seeks to enhance tumor immunity, there's a fine line between enhancing the tumor immunity and the development of autoimmunity. And so checkpoint blockade immunotherapy is not without its uh, risks. And finally, um, it, as far as some of the T-cell immunotherapies, the one difficulty that can be pointed out is that they can only be performed in specialized hospitals. They're very expensive, and it's not likely that a patient in a rural area in a small rural hospital will be able to be treated in this way. So, um, so this raises a number of questions. I've listed four questions here, which we feel are particularly important. Uh, and that is, um, why, do some patient, why do some patients show remarkable responses to cancer immunotherapy while others do not? Uh, a second question that I really will focus most of this uh, webinar on is how can we improve effectiveness, specificity, and safety of cancer immunotherapy? Should immunotherapy be combined with other forms of cancer therapy, and if so, which ones? And what are the best model systems to address these questions? And I would say that looking at these questions along with many others, that we are at a place now where at the, we're at the beginning of the end of cancer, but certainly not the end of cancer as a disease. And so we have a lot of work ahead of us, but at least now we're working uh, with great expectations of things to come. So, um, so I, I would, like to sort of begin uh, some of the discussion with, with our work on cancer immunoediting, um, because we asked several years ago, what are the targets of cancer immunoediting and what mechanism does editing uh, occur? And so this was based, of course, like many of the scientific uh, investigations on work of others. And so early work from the labs of Terry Boone in Brussels and Hans Schreiber at the University of Chicago suggested that tumor-specific mutations can sometimes function as tumor-specific rejection antigens. And I'll tell you more about antigens in a moment. We've come at a time now when a lot of the genome sequencing efforts by our uh, genomics colleagues uh, are being applied towards cancers. And these kinds of efforts reveal that all cancers express mutations, some a lot, some, uh, some very few, but nevertheless, they do have uh, these mutations that, are, uh, that, that result in abnormal proteins. Now, on the basis of one such study, in fact, an early study, James Allison and Bert Fogelstein sequencing um, uh, breast cancer 
uh, breast cancers, predicted that many or most of these tumors that express these mutations would also therefore express mutational antigens. So these are called neoantigens. And so we asked whether a combination of exome sequencing, RNA sequencing, and epitope prediction could help us define tumor-specific mutations that form tumor-specific mutant neoantigens and whether such neoantigens are important targets of the cancer immunoediting process. So, um, so let's just divert, uh, uh, just uh, change course for a moment and just mention two things about uh, tumor uh, neoantigens. First of all, the comment that all tumors have uh, mutations. Um, and, and some of these mutations are called driver mutations. These are mutations that contribute causally to tumor formation. They provide cancer cells with growth or survival advantages. They're relatively early events in tumor formation. And they're also relatively limited number uh, in, per cancer cells. So in other words, maybe two to five uh, driver mutations. Examples of these would be oncogenes, which um, when they are mutated are a gain of function mutation. So they drive the, the, uh, the, the mutations to the, the transformation process. And tumor suppressors, where it's a loss of function mutation, uh, indicating that, that now it's easier for a cell to fully transform into a cancer cell. But the other type of mutation is a, called a passenger mutation. So these are functionally neutral. Tumor cells don't really care whether the passenger mutations are present because they don't need them to either survive or expand. The mutations in, that are called passenger mutations can arise as a consequence of genomic instability that very often accompanies cancer formation, and they develop throughout cancer evolution. So these mutations that are sort of going along for the ride vary in number per cell. Sometimes you can see tumor cells that have as many as 1,000 passenger mutations. And they can also be expressed in a heterogeneous manner. So obviously, for the immune system, it doesn't care about the function of the mutation here. It just cares about whether the mutation is seen as foreign. So we in the field don't necessarily differentiate between a passenger mutation or a driver mutation in making a good vaccine for cancer, just that they form a good target for the immune system. And so this raises the issue then of what these targets are. And of course, the targets that we're talking about here are tumor antigens. So these are what the immune system sees that can differentiate a cell having these uh, unusual proteins in them compared to normal cells. And as you see here, there's four classes of uh, tumor antigens. The one that has probably been tried the hardest therapeutically are ones that are called tumor-associated antigens, or TAA. These are antigens that are shared by cancer cells and by normal cells. They can be expressed in an overexpression in a cancer, or they could be aberrantly expressed uh, in, in a cancer cell where ordinarily the parental cell doesn't express it. They can also be cell type differentiation antigens, but the key here is that there are normal cells in the body that have these proteins. So these proteins are encoded in the genome and therefore we have already developed a form of tolerance to them that, uh, that limits the ability of the immune system to react against them. Sort of a subset of these TAAs are oncofetal antigens. These are antigens expressed during fetal development, but also uh, during, oops, I did, made a mistake here, during fetal development, but also during uh, or in cancer. Again, these are encoded in the genome. And so again, you have the tolerance issue uh, to, uh, to deal with. A third type are the cancer testes antigens. Now, these are probably better targets than the other ones because these are expressed only in cancer cells and gonadal cells. So, in, for example, in the testes or the ovaries. But these, again, are encoded in the genome. Because these antigens tend to be expressed in tumors 
from, a, from several different cancer patients. Early work trying to develop cancer vaccines focused on these type of antigens. Um, and while there were some successes here, the successes overall were rather disappointing in as not moving us uh, to, a, to, to a curative response as much as that we had hoped. Theoretically, the last group here, these tumor-specific antigens, may be the best targets of all because these are antigens that are expressed only in the tumor cells, but not in normal cells. They represent either mutated oncogenes or mutated tumor suppressors. they are mutated normal uh, genes giving rise to mutated proteins. Uh, they're products of oncogenic viruses, or they can be tumor-specific post-synthetically modified proteins or lipids, but ones that are only uh, produced in the tumor. The important thing of the TSAs is that they are not encoded in the genome. So to the host immune system, uh, they actually look like foreign antigens. And so in this case, we can make the immune system believe that these are just simply viral proteins or bacterial proteins and therefore um, might be able to develop a stronger immune response to these. So in 2012, using kind of a combined genomics approach, a, a, a bioinformatics prediction approach, and good hardcore immunology, we were able to show that we could develop a method to find um, to define these uh, express mutations in tumors in a very rapid manner. It's not to say that investigators couldn't have done this before. In fact, many did, but it was very labor intensive. It took months of months of work to define the antigens, um, but we were able to now reduce that uh, time of refinement down to a matter of a week or two instead of spending four to six months uh, doing it. We were able to show that in these mouse uh, sarcoma models that we work with, that, uh, that they resemble carcinogen-induced human cancers. So they look like lung cancers from smokers, et cetera. Using this technique that we developed, we were able to identify a single protein that had a single amino acid uh, change, a point mutation, and this was a major tumor-specific rejection antigen of the particular tumor that we used called D42M1. We then went on to show that D42M1 undergoes immunoediting in wild-type mice when you transplant it into wild-type mice. And what grows out of these mice were tumors that lack the major rejection antigen. And we went on to show that immunoediting occurs via T-cell-induced immunoselection uh, mechanisms. So that was largely a, a study of the natural immune response against the tumor, showing that neoantigens, in fact, are critical targets of the natural immune response uh, in, in, um, in selecting or shaping the tumor to make it better, uh, more fit to grow in an immunocompetent host. So that told us that cancer immunoediting occurs as a consequence of a Darwinian immunoselection process acting on a tumor cell population that displays heterogeneous expression of strong uh, tumor-specific mutant neoantigens, resulting in evolution of tumor cell variants that lack major rejection antigens with reduced immunogenicity. So um, Again, this was a focus on natural immune responses to developing cancers. And this prompted us then to begin to ask the question that was more clinically relevant. That is, what happens to the immune system and can it handle uh, 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 tumors that have become established in an immunocompetent individual? And so we asked the next three questions. Can edited tumors be controlled by checkpoint blockade immunotherapy, one of the immunotherapies that I've already spoken to you about? If so, what are the antigenic targets of T cells that are reinvigorated by this therapy? And can we improve upon checkpoint blockade uh, therapy? And so two years later, uh, we had an answer to these questions. 
And I've listed for you essentially the summary of, of these answers. We did show that even after editing, many tumors still maintain a level of immunogenicity that can be attacked using cancer immunotherapy. And so some tumors are indeed susceptible uh, to cancer, some edited tumors are indeed susceptible to cancer immunotherapy. We used our immunogenomics approach that I described to you to rapidly identify tumor-specific mutations that function as the tumor neoantigen targets of uh, the immunotherapy approach. In fact, we again found that neoantigens are the favored targets of T cells activated by checkpoint uh, antibodies. These are not the same neoantigens, of course, that are eliminated during uh, the uh, immunoediting phase, but are the ones that remain in the tumor that are not seen uh, selectively by natural immunity, but can be seen uh, upon immunotherapy. And then importantly, we showed that the neoantigens can be used in therapeutically effective personalized cancer vaccines. So this is the kind of approach that we use now. If this could be actually a, uh, a, a mouse model system or a cancer patient. We basically identify, we basically harvest the tumor and normal tissue from, um, from our cancer patient. We uh, sequence the tumor looking at whole exome sequencing and um, and also uh, RNA sequencing. So we're really looking for those mutant uh, proteins which are expressed in the, uh, in the cancer cell. We ID these expressed mutations. We then pipeline uh, the sequences into uh, epitope prediction algorithms that use bioinformatic uh, approaches to identify those mutations that these uh, prediction algorithms would suggest are going to be the best uh, neoantigens. We prioritize the list based on their uh, 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 binding affinity to uh, the major histocompatibility complex proteins. We then apply filters. We synthesize peptides that, that um, entail the uh, mutation that we've detected and then we look for uh, the ability of, are we right or are we wrong by doing uh, in vitro and in vivo uh, analyses, and also then looking to see whether they form a good vaccine. So I won't show you all the data, but I, I, I do want to show you this data because I think it's particularly pertinent. We went through a whole series of biochemical, biophysical uh, analyses, immunological analyses, and found that we were able to predict with some degree of certainty at least a proportion of those neoantigens, those mutations in our tumor cell that uh, form good neoantigens. And what I'm showing you on the left of this slide is a survival curve of mice bearing that particular tumor called T3. And these mice are then treated with the different checkpoint antibodies, either anti-PD-1 alone or anti-CTLA-4 anti alone, or both together. And you see all the lines going across the top of that um, panel indicates, in fact, that we've been able to protect 100% of the mice by treatment with the checkpoint antibodies. This is in contrast to the control-treated, uh, antibody-treated mice seen in the black line on the left side, where, in fact, by 35 days, all of the mice uh, succumbed to their cancers. The important thing is that, as I've mentioned, these treatments are not without risk. And so we wanted to know if we thought, uh, if, we, if we felt strongly that the T cells were seeing tumor specific neoantigens, theoretically, we should be able to vaccinate our tumor bearing mice with the antigens that the T cells saw. And so these two antigens, a mutant form of Lamin and alpha subunit 4 and a mutant glycosidase called uh, ALG8 are the two major antigens in the T3 tumor. And as you can see on the right side in the red line here, that, that um, animals bearing tumors that are now vaccinated with the actual targets of the T cells 
are now become responsive to that vaccine and uh, reject their tumors. And about 80 or 90 percent of these animals survive, a, a comparable number compared to the checkpoint blocking antibody use on the left. And you can see just the controls here, the adjuvant that was used, poly-IC, or a irrelevant a peptide vaccine made with human papillomavirus um, and poly-IC uh, were ineffective. But I must say that if this were the only advantage that after all this work, all we could do was do as well as the checkpoint blockade, I don't think that that would have been sufficient um, uh, justification to moving forward. But this slide shows you that justification. When you do these kinds of experiments in, in um, small animal models, you tend to begin your treatment of your tumor bearing animal at a very early stage when the tumors are very small. And as you see on the left, which is just a recapitulation of the data that I just showed you, that if you treat a tumor bearing animal with anti-PD-1 monotherapy, or the vaccine made with the tumor neoantigens, you can protect a high percentage of the mice, if not all of the mice, uh, from uh, a susceptibility to their growing cancers. These cancers are rejected. The animals are actually cured of their uh, cancer. But if you let the tumors get larger, um, in this case, it, for these mice, about a centimeter in diameter, which for a mouse is a huge tumor, you see you lose the effectiveness of the anti-PD-1 monotherapy or the vaccine monotherapy. But when you combine them, you recover your therapeutic window. And so what this is telling us is that we think that it will ultimately be a combinatorial type of therapeutic approach with a personalized vaccine on the one hand, but together with um, a checkpoint antibody on the other that would probably be the most effective clinically. So what this work did uh, was to really cause a paradigm shift in how one could use cancer vaccines to treat uh, cancers. The old way shown on the left side was to use these vaccines made with tumor associated antigens. And remember, I have told you that those type of antigens are already shared between the tumor cell and normal cells. We already have central tolerance to these antigens. Um, it becomes very difficult to induce a protective immune response against the tumor if, in fact, there's all this tolerance going on. The targets, as I mentioned, are present across tissues. And so even if you did evolve a good immune response, there is a risk of autoimmunity where your anti-tumor response now becomes an autoimmune response. But the tumor-specific neoantigens are quite uh, a, a, a different ballgame. First of all, they are foreign proteins uh, because they're not encoded in the genome. That mutation is occurring only in somatic cells. And so uh, you have an increased immunogenicity right from the beginning of the target that you're looking at. The targets are unique and specific, and that means that you uh, have much less tolerance to them and uh, you have uh, a great deal less opportunity here of developing autoimmunity. And again, in that regard, because it's only the tumor that expresses these abnormal proteins, your entire immune response is against one cell type in the body, and that's the tumor and not normal cells. And so you get around with a lot of the, away from a lot of the uh, potential problems. So. The big question was, okay, well, that's great, but can we take advantage of these insights and use them to develop personalized cancer neoantigen vaccines for human cancer patients that are safe, specific, and effective immunotherapies? And so this is now the approach that several groups are using, including our own. Uh, one is, again, this, um, this genomic approach to define on a genomic basis mutant uh, genes that are present in the uh, tumor cells and to find which of those genes are actually transcribed into protein. Um, you select your candidate uh, neoepitopes 
You make a vaccine. I'm showing you here a long peptide, a synthetic long peptide vaccine. It can be other types of vaccines that I think um, we can talk about later on. And you can initiate vaccine treatment and then follow the patients by monitoring what's happening to their immune response against the tumor and of course monitoring their tumor burden. Today, depending on the type of vaccine that you wanna generate, probably it takes between 10 and 16 weeks to go from biopsy to personalized cancer vaccine. I fully suspect that with the success that we're seeing now and with the hopefully continued success, that technology will be focused on this aspect of the program and this time frame will be reduced significantly. There have been three papers now, in addition to the work that I showed you in preclinical models, that are beginning to strongly suggest that this kind of cancer neoantigen personalized vaccines um, are going to be uh, effective in humans. An earlier study um, in 2015 by Beatrice Carreno and Jerry Lynette and Elaine Martis when uh, they were here at Washington University, actually were the first to show that a dendritic cell vaccine fed peptides that in, incorporated the mutant sequences of the neoantigens were able to induce uh, immune responses in, um, in melanoma patients that had been surgically resected. And they found two kinds of responses. There are T cells that are pre-existing in some of these melanoma patients. They found that their vaccine enhanced uh, their, uh, their, their, the number of T cells that were against those, uh, those specificities. And then they found that there were new T cells that hadn't been detectable before, but could be detected following the vaccine, indicating that you were broadening the anti-tumor response. Um, in, in more recently, a few months ago, two papers from two groups, Nir Hakon and Kathy Wu, uh, from uh, Boston and uh, Uger Sahin from Germany reported that patients that, um, again, with melanoma that were vaccinated either in the case of the Wu uh, paper that, with a synthetic long peptide vaccine or in the case of the Sahin paper in uh, using a RNA-based vaccine, were able to, those vaccines were able to prevent recurrence of the cancers in the vaccinated patients. And maybe one additional point in the uh, uh, Hakonin Wu paper was that if there was an escape uh, from the vaccine or an unresponsiveness to the vaccine, certainly treating subsequently these patients with anti-PD-1, one of the immune checkpoint blocking antibodies, gave a phenomenal response and a, um, a complete uh, uh, elimination of the cancer. And so just in my last slide here, um, uh, th this kind of work has, has really uh, encouraged a lot of groups to begin uh, these kinds of clinical trials. Here at Washington University, we actually have nine clinical trials, some of which are already open and enrolling, uh, some of which are just about ready to enroll. Two in particular uh, in glioblastoma and in uh, non and in, um, in uh, triple negative breast cancer have treated patients, and we seem to be getting at least in some of these cases uh, uh, interesting immunological responses. It's too early uh, for um, uh, for looking at uh, clinical responses. But in addition to these two sites, we're also doing renal cancer, prostate cancer. Of course, melanoma, bladder cancer, pancreatic cancer, non-small cell lung cancer, and lymphoma. And if you see here, some of these are really tough cancers, glioblastoma and pancreatic, for example. Some are cancers that don't have high mutational loads like prostate cancer, um, but others that have very strong mutational, high mutational loads like small, non-small cell lung cancer and melanoma. And so we're really giving it a, a, a very good go in terms of the range of cancers that we'll look for uh, responses. So to conclude, what I've mentioned to you today is that the immune system can protect against cancer development and shape cancer immunogenicity by this natural process that we call cancer immunoediting. 
highly antigenic tumor specific neoantigens are targets of naturally occurring cancer immunoediting. After immunoediting has occurred, naturally cancers display reduced, but I want to stress not absent immunogenicities, and many edited cancers can still be controlled by immunotherapy. Mutant neoantigens remaining after editing are important T cell targets during immune checkpoint blockade therapy and personalized cancer immunotherapies targeting tumor-specific mutant neoantigens has been achieved in preclinical mouse tumor models, but I think really excitingly now recently in human cancer patients. So I'd like to stop here and acknowledge the large number of people who have participated in this uh, project. I won't go through them by names, but on the left are um, the people that have come through my lab over the years that have worked on this project. In the middle, people um, at Washington University um, uh, who have uh, contributed and been integral parts of the studies. Of course, um, my longstanding collaborator, Mark Smith, and of course, Lloyd Old, who was the, the guide so much for these studies uh, and a close collaborator while he was alive. Um, and all of the people on the right who from other institutions contributed thoughts and reagents, et cetera, that we are uh, incredibly grateful for. And then finally, also funding and one really shout out to the Cancer Research Institute that was there really from the very beginning with us, um, who uh, supported our work, who, uh, whose support of our uh, postdoctoral trainees and even early on some of our pre-doctoral trainees really made this um, possible. So I thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. All right, well, th well, thank you very much for that, Dr. Schreiber. Are, are you able to see me or are you seeing a, a black box? <laughs> okay, good. Well, that was quite a, an introduction uh, to the concept of antigens, neoantigens, uh, how the immune system sees cancer, how it shapes cancer, and how you're taking all of that and turning it into, you know, personalized treatments, which I think is really cool. Um, you know, I've been with Cancer Research Institute for nearly 20 years, and 20 years ago, a lot of focus was on the development of therapeutic vaccines, um, but those seemed to not really get the job done. And as you pointed out, it was the checkpoint inhibitors that really blew the field wide open. And some were saying that vaccines had gone by the wayside and that, that we wouldn't be seeing much from them again. Now, with neoantigens, it seems like there's a resurgence of interest in vaccines. Do you, do you see vaccines on the ascendancy now uh, as a result of this work? Yes, I, I, I do. I think, um, you know, in part, uh, the, the failure of the vaccines previously was, as I mentioned, was the fact that we were trying to vaccinate against proteins in which there was a central tolerance to. So it made the immune system, it just was a brick wall for the immune system to climb over and it was too great. I think the interesting thing is that the finding not only of the power of the uh, checkpoint antibodies, but also the fact that the T cells that get reactivated once that checkpoint antibody has been added um, are against neoantigens, but only a subset of neoantigens. And so the thinking here is that with a vaccine, we can do better than the natural process. And so by combining the vaccine to get more neoantigens together with checkpoints, we think that this will become the, the standard fare in terms of treatment. So we're hoping very much that this will be the case, especially in cancers that have high mutations. So are you saying that um, these new type, this kind of vaccines 2.0 would um, target multiple antigens at the same time in patients? Yeah, yes. So the idea would be we would never want to focus on one or two antigens because if these antigens are these so-called passenger mutations that a tumor can live without, then the, the possibility exists that there may be tumor cells that don't express those antigens. So you treat with your vaccine, you select against the ones that have the antigens in them, you leave behind the ones that have either different antigens or lack that targeting. So what we, what most people are doing in their vaccines essentially is to, um, 
to put in 10 to 20 different epitopes. So the idea would be hit as many possible uh, antigens, neoantigens, as we can together with checkpoint blockade and make it most effective. So uh, walk me through this. Uh, let's say I'm, uh, I'm a cancer patient and um, I'm at your, your, your treatment facility and the doctor suggests um, that now would be a good time to consider a, uh, a clinical trial. And, and I guess it would have to be a clinical trial at this stage, right? There's no FDA approved neoantigen vaccine. Um, if, if I'm that Correct. patient, um, do, do I, what, what would I, what should I ask my doctor? I mean, should I, should I just know that I have these neoantigens? Does every patient have neoantigens? Um, is a patient going to know whether or not they would be eligible for a study like that? Yeah, so um, that's an important question, I think. I, I think obviously, um, probably almost every tumor has some neoantigens. Um, you won't know that until your biopsy is taken and your, your tumor is sequenced. I think that's a very important thing. Of course, that's not a particularly painful part of the, the treatment. And, um, and now in a relatively short period of time, you know, you'll go back to your physician and that physician will have the data to say your tumor has perhaps a sufficient number of neoantigens that would be worthwhile trying a vaccine together with a checkpoint antibody. Probably everyone will receive at some point some form of checkpoint uh, antibodies. And we're thinking initially uh, the, the, um, the, the checkpoint antibody treatment will start immediately, and then the vaccine will be uh, administered very soon after, as soon as the data from the sequencing occurs and the vaccine can be made. So I think, and then you can also say, well, how does this compare to chemotherapy, right, and, or radiation therapy? And so it's been pretty remarkable that the patients who have been treated right now with cancer vaccines, even without checkpoint, um, have really not suffered many um, adverse events. So it's, it's, it's quite safe. Um, it's, uh, it, and, and I think that it, it does, and I think it even trains the immune system when they do, develop, when they do get uh, uh, checkpoint blockade therapy, that the immune system now becomes much more focused on the tumor itself. You mentioned that in some of the studies you showed us toward the end there that uh, the, uh, the neoantigen vaccines were able to prevent recurrence of disease. And you also showed that a, the combination of checkpoint blockade with neoantigen vaccine uh, seemed uh, or proved to be advantageous at later stages of cancer development. So when you've got these larger, larger tumors rather than smaller tumors. Um, is there a preference for uh, the stage that a cancer is at? Um, if I'm a patient and I'm told I have stage one cancer or stage uh, three cancer, um, does either of those make me more likely to benefit from a neoantigen vaccine? I would think that the more likely you are to have a cancer that is still almost a primary cancer and is not metastasized, is um, that there at least you're you're hitting against one target. Because once the cells become metastatic, they begin to change their neoantigen profiles. There's still, you can tell it has come from a primary tumor. Many, there are targets still there, but they begin to segregate into different targets in different metastatic sites. So clearly as everything, getting it earlier is better. Um, you're also fighting the, the role of the immune system, um, being able to just how many tumor cells can a good T cell kill, even with a vaccine. So it's possible that some of the later stage cancers will still want to have debulking, which surgical debulking, for example, to get rid of most of the cancers that are, that are easily uh, attainable and, and, and removable. So... I think though, but like everything in cancer, the earlier, the better. Well, I, I think it's just really fascinating, this, this whole idea of, of neoantigen as uh, immunogenic targets, targets especially uh, because with other, other vaccines um, or in any patient who ultimately goes on to develop um, clinically detectable cancer, 
they might think that there, there is nothing more the immune system can do. Um, so it's wonderful that, or that all the viable targets have been exhausted, but here you are saying, no, there's, there's all these other targets we, we could go after. How, how, how accurate or how successful, what's, is there a percentage of success in, in terms of identifying, using those algorithms to identify or predict which um, antigens are going to, to be more likely to respond um, or, or trigger an immune response in a patient? It, does every uh, every patient who undergoes that sequencing are are you going to come out on the other end with some targets or is it is it hit or miss? Yeah, I, I think it depends on which targets you're looking at. I would say that none of it is perfect yet. Um, in fact, we've got a long way to go still. I think the targets for the real killer T cells, the CD8 T cells, the cytolytic T cells, um, we're probably a little bit better at more accurately identifying than the targets for the helper T cells, the CD4 T cells that are ones that are, are presented by a, a different MHC molecule. So it's an evolving process. Um, everyone's got their own secret sauce. We don't really know who um, is more accurate in predicting what kind of uh, uh, tumor antigens or, or the the tumor mutations that form the better tumor antigens. All the predictions now are based on the binding of this piece of the mutant protein to, the, to an MHC molecule, which is half the interaction, because the other half is the T cell receptor that now sees that complex from the top. And we're only now beginning to develop algorithms and predictive pro, uh, algorithms that would allow us to make some conclusion about what the T cells would rather see. But this is a very active area. It's a very evolved process. Um, there is, of course, the Tesla project that is um, um, being sponsored by, um, um, by the Parker Institute that is looking at, and the CRI, uh, that is looking at um, uh, comparing the predictability of, of the different groups in terms of who has a better prediction algorithm than the other, although, you know, it'll all be kept secret, but each group will find out where they exist on the 35 member panel that is looking at this. But this is the, probably the most active area uh, uh, that is ongoing. I, yeah, I'm glad you brought up the the tumor neoantigen epitope selection alliance. That's that's an exciting uh, project uh, partnership that we have with Parker Institute, yeah. and we're we're thrilled that that you're a, a major engine behind the, that whole project, and and we expect great things as usual to come to come from that. Um, I I think uh, I I would just like to to I just reiterate and to frame this for anyone who's who's watching. Uh, that this is a very new approach, relatively new approach to treatment. Um, as you said, it's very early stage. These uh, neoantigen treatments may not be available everywhere. In fact, um, I don't know, uh, Bob, if there's, you know, can you count on your hand the number of places that are testing these, or is it, or is it much broader than that at this stage? Well, I think it's it been explosive in the last year. Um, so what used to be just a handful of places being committed to doing such things, we now have um, many academic institutions that are that are uh, trying to do this uh, for different cancers. We have the development of biotechs that are focused in on this. We even have now the interest in large pharma, which is quite a major step forward because this is very personalized, as you can tell. Uh, immunotherapy and is kind of against the the um, big pharma paradigm of off the shelf. I do think that there may be some off the shelf vaccines that may come of this uh, as we do more and more. But right now, it's really considered to be highly personalized. But the best I can give you is that there are 35 independent groups from all aspects of from academic uh, research, research from from a, a biotech, from large pharma that are participating in this comparative project, which to me is a really remarkable collaboration uh, among very, a, a variety of very competing uh, groups. So I think that it will be, um, we'll learn a lot in the next year. So 35 groups now, I, I suspect this will 
climb and as more and more of these reports like the two that I showed you um, from Kathy Wu and Nir ha uh, and uh, uh, Ugar Sahin showing encouraging clinical outcomes from these kinds of neoantigen vaccines, I think more and more people will get involved. I think, I think it's exciting that this is a, a platform, a therapeutic platform that can be applied uh, to just about any type of cancer, including uh, very rare cancers that don't tend to receive a lot of um, attention because they occur in such a small amount of, uh, of the population. So if I'm a patient with coleoangiosarcoma, uh, which is pretty rare, um, might I go to a, a treatment center like yours and, and might I participate? Are there exclusion criteria on the cancers that are being studied right now? You know, there are, I, I haven't seen many include, uh, exclusion criteria. The, the usual thing is you have to find a, uh, an institution who has a principal investigator who's committed to doing that kind of cancer, that knows that kind of cancer. And so that's where you'll see different institutions having different selection criteria because they would only be for breast cancer or pancreatic cancer, et cetera, but not, not all comers at this point in time. But it does raise one in interesting issue that I should mention, which you probably were about to ask. And that is, what about the cancers that have low mutational loads? And we're very excited about some of the work that's coming out. And that is the finding that some groups, including us, have made, is that if you have a cancer that actually we have model cancers that have no mutations. They have no, um, they have no neoantigens, but a very light uh, exposure to uh, irradiation uh, leads to generation of neoantigens in these tumors that now become susceptible to immunotherapy, whether it be checkpoint blockade immunotherapy or, um, uh, or, or neoantigen vaccines. So this is very exciting that we have sort of a, a second line of treatment, which is it doesn't have to be first line therapy for this kind of personalized vaccine. It can be the result of going in someone who's failed standard of care therapy, but with a type of therapy that induces neoantigen formation within the tumor. Well, that's, that's great news um, that we can take these kind of what are called immunologically cold tumors and heat them up so that they express these foreign neoantigens to the immune system and thereby become targets for immunotherapy. That, that is all the time that we have today, Dr. Schreiber. I always enjoy speaking with you and I once again congratulate you on the, the Bowsen Prize, which you'll be receiving uh, next month in Europe. Um, so uh, congrats on that, and it's very well deserved. Thank you. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank once again our very generous sponsors who have made this webinar series possible. And to remind you that we do have an Immunotherapy Patient Summit coming up in Tampa on December 9th and in Houston on January 27th. Registration is free. This is an opportunity for you to hear firsthand from experts about the latest developments in, in cancer immunotherapy. You can also network with other cancer patients, some of whom have received a cancer immunotherapy, hear their stories directly, and you can make an appointment with a clinical trial navigator who can help you find clinical trials, such as those Dr. Schreiber uh, spoke about in today's webinar if you are interested in neoantigens. Uh, the Cancer Research Institute uh, has a resource for patients. If you want to learn more about immunotherapy for a particular type of cancer, go to cancerresearch.org forward slash patients uh, to see all, all the many different types of cancer that are currently being treated with immunotherapy, uh, a list of clinical trials, and we also have a clinical trial finder service there as well. All of these webinars are recorded and made available on the Cancer Research Institute website at cancerresearch.org forward slash webinars. You can also find us on YouTube. Thank you all for watching today. And thanks again, Dr. Schreiber, for, for spending your time with us today. Thank you, Brian.